monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast, I talk with Dr. Lauren Tucker about inclusion management and leading humans in the 21st century. Dr. Lauren Tucker, welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you again. You're joining us from Chicago. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about inclusion management and leading humans in the 21st century. Uh, What are the shifts that are occurring? Uh, We have all these macro conditions in the world around us that are changing rapidly. That's impacting uh, the world of work. That's impacting the HR function. That's impacting people management and organizational leaders. Um, Within that context, then there's all these additional types of shifts around expectations and attitudes in the workplace and what people are expecting when they go to work for organizations. All of this just means that the work of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging that happens in organizations is going to continue to evolve, uh, hopefully continue to gain greater foothold uh, and have more prominence and importance within organizations. But it means that we're going to be leading people differently, you know, today and in the future than perhaps was effective in how we led people in the past. So this is what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Lauren's bio with everybody. With over 30 years of experience, Dr. Lauren Tucker is the founder and CEO of Do What Matters, where she has been helping companies like Periscope find the confidence required to sustainably integrate inclusion strategies into their business models, resulting in greater creativity, innovation, representation, and growth. I could go on, Lauren, but I think I'll pause there. Anything else you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Uh, no, that sounds sounds pretty complete. I will say that as I have worked through um, with with so many companies, including, as you mentioned, Periscope, but Quad Graphics, uh, the Richards Group, which is now TRG, um, Lewis Media Partners. There, there are a number of organizations that I've been looking, you know, working with. Braze um, is another one, and I will say that. What I have learned is that the situation is even more critical around managing talent, that it really goes beyond DEI, that today's leaders just need to learn how to manage humans differently and better. And if they are able to do that, the situation will improve for those who are on the margins as well, yeah. and we'll get greater diversity and in, in, in representation. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. One of the things I thought we could start with is uh, this idea, you know, as we were preparing for this episode, you sent over some notes and um, there's this note about the cost of inequity, how lack of diversity and inclusion at work is costing companies a mil- uh, a trillion plus dollars annually uh, in the aggregate. Um, that's a, an incredible number. So from the 
human perspective, you know, we're like thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging efforts. And we're like, yeah, that's the right thing to do. We need to treat people well, treat them with dignity and respect, give people equal, equal opportunity, empower people, et cetera. All these things that are so important. It's just the right thing to do from a business perspective though. My goodness, a trillion plus lost annually um, due to the inequities that we see within our organizations. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? This, I think, will help to to lay the groundwork for the rest of the conversation. Yeah, well, let me first give you a, a caveat, Jonathan. Since we last talked, um, I've, uh, I guess to my team, I've become even more alarmingly straight, no chaser. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've become a fierce, well, I've always been a fierce talent advocate. I have to tell you, I'm even more so today and so i'm i'm not going to i'm not going to sugarcoat what i'm going to say today because if somebody doesn't ring the bell um mm-hmm. and i I'm, I'm willing to lose all kinds of potential clients to ring the bell on this we have to first of all we have to get beyond this issue of talking about dei this is dei is important but it oftentimes this focus obscures the larger issue of talent abuse and we're seeing a lot of talent abuse. We're seeing a lot of talent abuse. We're seeing a lot of this, this growing divide between leaders, managers, um, and, and the talent force. We are seeing it at a time when talent, and my God, I'm t- telling you, I'm a data scientist. I've, I've, I've been there. AI is not going to replace human talent. We may have to reallocate, we may have to rethink, but I want to stop that. There's just all kinds of things that are distracting us from the fact that we live in an economy dependent on knowledge, creativity, and innovation. That means the uniquely human capabilities. And we are in a situation where leadership has doubled down on the abuse of talent, largely to cover up their air, well, to, to pursue continued arrogance and to cover up the managerial incompetencies that we are seeing. So let's get back to what you just, just asked this cost. This isn't just a matter of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a matter of managerial incompetency and the fact that t- the talent force has to pay the price for this. Bad decision-making during COVID, over-hiring during COVID, the wrong decisions being made. And these folks are not being called to account. Instead, the people who are paying for it is the talent force. And as a result, the first jobs that get shed under these conditions are people in talent management, people in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and people who are on the margins. And so we have to really right size this conversation because if we make it all about diversity first, we really aren't seeing the larger picture. And we've got to put that larger picture around talent in the frame. Yeah, I like that. So so any sort of uh, abuse of exploitation uh, within the workplace, whether we're talking about whatever group of individual we're talking about, it's wrong and it shouldn't happen with any employees, with any individuals. It's always going to be hurting um, the organization's effectiveness, productivity, creativity, innovation. Of course, it's going to have a really negative human impact on on the people who are experiencing um, these abuses and exploitation. Uh, and like you said too, with with accountability, it's amazing how much leaders love to talk about accountability and performance when it's going downstream. Um, very often they don't like that accountability when it's the 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 spotlight's shown back on them, uh, right? And nobody expects perfection. Like we we get it that COVID was a messy time and it was hard, and organizational leaders had to make a lot of decisions very rapidly, and they didn't get it right a lot of the time. Nobody ex- expects perfection, but what we do hope for and expect, and I think we should expect, is that there will be accountability. And that there can be transparency and that leaders will um, stand by their decisions and or learn from failures and try to to grow and develop and and bring in more uh, diverse voices so they can make better decisions in the future. Like we don't expect perfection, but we expect growth. We expect development and we, we want accountability. And it really is crazy 
how often um, leaders who are often the root cause of a lot of the problems the organization's facing end up scapegoating people below them, end up leaning on and turning the screws on the people below them. Um, it's the people below them that are the ones dealing with the layoffs and uh, the burnout and the overwork and all those sorts of things. Uh, you know, all that that does need to stop. And you're absolutely right that it's mu- it's a much broader pro- problem than just the the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, conversation, which is of course important, but uh, a subset. Yeah, I mean, I I think you know, and again, I'm straight no chaser. I have not the. <laughs> these leaders and their arrogance have put on a show of what I like to call showing their asses um, lately. I, I'm just going to say it. I, I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked at the disregard, but I'm shocked of the obvious disregard. It's so obvious now. And these leaders are sitting on tons of cash. They're sitting on tons of cash, tons of profits that they made during COVID, mind you. Um, And yet they're saying that they can't, they don't have enough money to pay talent that, you know, they're pulling in tons of cash for low performance. So I think we have to, one of the things I I am out to bust right now is the myth of meritocracy. It is a myth that we continue to use to bully talent, performance reviews. If I ever hear again, a if the the idea of pips or those performance what are they performance improvement plans yep um they are not focused on performance they're not pro, pro you know focused on improvement and the only plan that is behind that is the abuse of talent and because they always funny how nobody cares about you know performance improvement at the beginning of somebody's hiring but somehow when they need to get rid of talent easily, they'll come up with ways to do it. And the plan is to improve all the ways they can figure out how to get rid of talent. We got to come up with a better plan. And I am not sure, and I will admit this, and I I cannot lie to you, Jonathan. I am, some of the stories, you know, I'm writing a book actually called Your Employees Hate You. <laughs> I have been asked by many people who have said, do you think that's a little harsh, Lauren? Do you think that's a, maybe we should, you know, maybe you should pull back on that. Maybe it's not about your employees hate you. The stories that are coming into me, and I don't even have to ask for them. People see me as a talent advocate. They are writing me in link on LinkedIn. They're emailing me the stories that I hear from senior executives and some of the abuse that they've taken, because oftentimes they're left holding the bags for the, you know, for the C-suites incompetence. Um, And they're unable to manage um, humans the way that they want to manage this. I'm hearing a lot, especially from senior female executives who have on, on, the surface made a lot of strides. We see a lot of strides coming in, but in big companies, whether it's holding companies or larger entities, Fortune 500, I'm hearing so many stories of these self-same women who are calling me saying, this is not the job I had expected. I am being thrown under the bus by the male colleagues in the C-suite or in the, the, the upper echelons of the company or the founders. Um, we are in a situation where I, I have great questions about whether anything can overcome the cronyism and the leadership arrogance mm-hmm. of the generation of company and corporate leaders that are in place today. I hope that the next generation of leaders who have experienced so much of this abuse and, you know, just general incompetence will get an opportunity to change things. But what I am hearing right now from leaders, from even C-suite leaders who are trying to do the right thing from the, 
you know, from the bottom to the top, I'm hearing alarming stories of abuse, of malfeasance, of personal vendettas, of cronyism. Yeah. And, and these are in Fortune 500 companies. And I am alarmed by this. So we have to get our heads around managing humans better. I just don't know if the generation of leaders in place today are going to be the ones to do it. I, I've seen plenty of those things myself. <laughs> we, I think we can, and probably everyone in the audience can can point to um, at least uh, things they've heard from colleagues or people, uh, other, other organizations. And sadly, probably most of us can point to very specific examples within the organizations that we find ourselves in or places we've been recently. Um, it, it is sad. It's a very sad thing when ego gets in the way, arrogance gets in the way, um, you have, you have in some cases, I mean, literally psychopathic leaders <laughs> within organizations and it's, they're narcissistic. It's all about them. They don't care who they step on along the way. Personal vendettas, like you said, I mean, I've seen way too much of that. Um, those, those sorts of things, I suppose th- these sorts of things always exist within hierarchies. And when you have, um, when you have disproportionate power, with different individuals, <laughs> the, the the worst of human nature often comes out, and, and uh, unfortunately, you often have people um, rise to levels of prominence and positions of power who, you know, might end up being some of the worst actors <laughs> ultimately in how they treat people. Um, so we need we do need to figure out how to do this better, how to promote people better, how to choose the right people for leadership roles better, um, so that we don't continue to perpetuate these types of challenges. Yeah. And I think the real question is, you know, the the real issue is we have um, lost our ability uh, to understand what a good leader should be, what their performance should be. We're also incentivizing leaders that may otherwise choose the best, the better path, but we're incentivizing them um, inappropriately. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, every time we tie things so completely to share price, Mm -hmm. we are incentivizing bad behavior. And what really is interesting is that share price returning, you know, returning investor value, it's, it's easy to make money. It's hard to make more money. And what I think we have done is we have focused leaders on short-term gains and the long-term value of companies is being missed. And unless boards of directors get it in their heads that they need to start looking for long-term performers, long-term performance, and understanding very specifically what that is and how to management and how to management manage it and in part, those leaders should be also incentivized and how well their talent force perceives their performance. That should be just as important as anything else because talent is the engine of growth. And this kind of systemic, it, it's really a systemic malfeasance, a systemic um, poor management practices that were really spawned in the late uh, 20th century and early 19th, I mean, early 21st century. Um, again, as I say, you know, those of us who came of age during those times were raised by wolves. So these folks have not learned anything different and they're too arrogant to learn something new. And that is the basis of the problems with today's C-suites, today's CEOs, COOs, CFOs, is that they think they don't need to learn anything different. They don't. They think they've arrived. And I get it. I get it. There are times when I sit there and say, oh, my God, do I need to learn how to do something different? Do I need to learn how to, oh, my God, you know, somebody's, you know, pointed out something else I need to do. But you know what? That's what that's what they get paid to do, to learn better practices. And what I'm seeing is the elevation and of, of leaders that continue to actually perform poorly. 
And they just move to the next thing and the next thing because cronyism takes over. And I look, at, you know, I'm a data scientist at heart I've done, you know, for most of my career. So I'm able to put numbers together and I'm amazed at how many CEOs get rewarded for poor performance. It's stunning. And so when these same, these self-same leaders start holding the talent force responsible for their failures, it, as you can tell, Jonathan, it really pisses me off. I am incensed. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm on a roll this week because I've heard too many stories just this week alone that are just horrifying to me. And I am, and these are folks, and I will tell you, you know, you're, you're, you know, there's an issue when white guys call me who are good performers call me and their problem isn't some woman or some black person took their job. They're telling me another white dude who's a leader of a company has completely undermined their ability to to perform and to do a great job. And they've been pushed out. That's why I'm saying diversity first is not where we need to focus. What we do need to focus on is improving leadership, uh, setting the better standards, higher standards for performance uh, with the C-suites and with the board of directors. And we need to start investing and allowing talent to do what they do best by making them true business partners. And that's really where leadership needs to go. They need to cultivate their talent force as true business partners. And spoiler alert, that's, that's the end game of my book. How do you create business partners out of talent? It requires a humbling. These leaders yeah. need to humble up. And they need to improve their own um, competencies. Yeah, yeah, well, well said. Uh, it it really is so so frustrating to see completely incompetent, ineffective leaders continually fall upwards <laughs> and and fall into new promotions and new opportunities. And you're like, in what world? Like, uh, what? Why are we doing this? Why? It doesn't make business sense even to do it but it's it's because of the cronyism it's because of the nepotism um uh, it's you know there's a variety of th things driving that um but ultimately let, like let's take a step back and and reevaluate how <laughs> how we're determining who's going to be a good leader and i and i agree i think having some intellectual humility about you uh is is got to be one of the first primary requirements to be in a leadership role um, you do not know it all. You do not have all the answers. You need to lean on the expertise of those around you. You need to continue to learn and grow and develop. Um, if something worked for you in the past, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you in the future. You know, just having that intellectual humility and checking your arrogance and your ego at the door, my goodness, that that alone would go a long way in helping us improve the situation uh, in a lot of organizations. Yeah, and I think too many leaders now, they just believe in their own hype. Um, and they believe in the hype of their roles. So it isn't always like the Elon Musks that I'm talking about, although I find him to be a horrifying leader. Um, but I will say that there are other leaders that just buy the hype of their own role. They, they've finally gotten to that CEO level and they feel like they can't be touched. They feel yeah. like they shouldn't be touched and they feel like um, the talent force is there to make them look good. And that is not that's, that's not going to feed, feed the bulldog. And we are looking right now at a talent force, which is why we continue, despite all of the layoffs and, the, oh, it's so horrifying, we continue to see very low um, unemployment rates because this is a talent force that has their options. Those other options, they're finally, I think, many of them making the gig economy work for them because they're okay with what that – buys them. Um, I think they are finding other ways of achieving their life aspirations. And those don't always mean corporate climbing. Um, these leaders keep thinking, you know, I, I love using the example of a Devil Wears Prada, where Miranda Priestley says, well, doesn't everybody want my job? Doesn't everybody? Everybody wants to be me. And Andy Sachs realizes, no, I don't want to be you. I'd rather make less, enjoy the work, do work that's meaningful, do work that's going to improve the world. And I don't want to be you. 
So I think a lot of the talent force is making that decision and finding other ways um, to be productive. And that's what they want to be. They want to be productive. They want to work. This assumption that talent doesn't want to work, that they don't want to put their capabilities in service of purpose and, and growth is another myth. It's another myth perpetuated by incompetent leaders who want to use it as a smoke screen for their own failures. Yep. Well said. <laughs> this has been a really fun conversation. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's I good. To, I'm straight, no chaser. <laughs> no, it's good. I think it's good to, to be straightforward and to, to tell it how it is. And sometimes it's just nice to be able to, to get these things out because it, it is frustrating. Lauren, I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience, how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yes. Well, you can always get uh, get in touch with us at uh, letsdoitmatters.com, which is our website. Um, for all who are interested, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn, where we've got a, a very socially active uh, page on LinkedIn, as well as I, I try to post as many things as I can to uh, educate people and also to amplify the voice of talent. Um, and that is really, you know, for me, that's the realization. Um, I've made a pivot to focus more on talent relationship management because that is the clear path to greater inclusion and to making everybody feel safe, valued, heard, and productive, which is really what everybody wants, including those who are on the margins, black and brown people, uh, LGBTQ plus women. And quite frankly, I've heard from enough white men <laughs> who are also feeling left out, marginalized and left behind. So it's really about talent relationship management and anybody who is interested in um, learning how to make your talent force, your business partners for growth, please reach out. Wonderful. Thank you, Lauren. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Lauren can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Monetizing digital services since 2004. Boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization.